Welcome to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Joyous conversations about what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about our one reality. You have nothing to fear. You are eternal and you are perfectly loved. Knowing the truth changes everything. Now, here's Roberta. Welcome to Seek Reality. I'm Roberta Grimes and I'm so happy you're with us today. Today our guest is a devoted scholar of spiritually transformative experiences, or STEs, which are, that's actually a new term now. We didn't have it even maybe 10 years ago, but he's an expert, and he's been in this field since the beginning. This is John R. Audet's fourth Seek Reality appearance, although his first two times with us were in our first year, and now we're celebrating our 10th year. John's career history has been in medical and hospice administration, which is where he first met people like Dr. Raymond Moody, even before Dr. Moody wrote Life After Life and started this whole process. John also met sainted pioneers in this field, like Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, for example. He's the principal founder as well of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, which is also called IANS. He's a native of South Florida, where he still resides, and his professional career has spanned over three decades of senior executive positions in hospice, hospital administration, physician practice management, as well as the performing arts and public broadcasting, so he kind of gets around. He originally earned a BA degree in history and sociology from Augusta College and an MS degree in sociology from Virginia Tech. More recently, John has contributed chapters about spiritually transformative experiences and non-local consciousness to several scholarly books, and he now serves as president and CEO of Eternia, which he co-founded with Dr. Evan Alexander and the late Dr. Edgar Mitchell. This is so wonderful. I love this story. The Apollo 14 astronaut who was the sixth man to walk on the moon. So talk about just absolutely spanning a wonderful time in history. John is a veteran with three years of active duty service in the U.S. Army during Vietnam, although he never made it there. And that's unlike my husband, who did make it to Vietnam, but he went as a pathologist. My husband spent his time in Vietnam tooling around Saigon in a chauffeur-driven Jeep. But I guess, does that count as service in Vietnam? I don't know. He talks about it as if it does. John R. Audet has written a book on spiritually transformative experiences, which I think is terrific. I urge you to read it. Uh, We can learn a lot from his book because he really was there and he really knows what he's writing about. His book is called Loved by the Light, True Stories of Divine Intervention and Providence, and it's now available on Amazon. We'll talk a little about about his book today, but we're going to talk about the history of this whole amazing field, which has now become common knowledge, but even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and certainly 40 years ago, no one had heard of it. John, welcome. It's lovely. It's lovely to have you back here with us again. It's great to see you, Roberta. Thank you for having me back. You're looking younger every time I see you. (laughs) Thank you, dear, so much. Doing the same great work. Well, but so are you. I, I love the things you're doing now. And I want to talk about the history because you were really instrumental in getting this all started. I mean, you met Raymond Moody, he was just discovering near-death experiences. What was that like? That is a great question, and it's an amazing story. I met Raymond in 1974, 50 years ago, almost to the day, actually. And um, I have to tell you that it was uh, the Ring of Destiny when I met him. Um, It was the defining moment of my life, bar none. And that the story didn't begin when I met Raymond. It actually began uh, when I was eight years old, 1960, uh, yesterday, uh, growing up in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I was in the third grade, and I had a best friend named Mike Waters, 
And uh, he lived halfway to my house on the way uh, home from school. So I would often stop at his place and have the, enjoy the proverbial milk and cookies. And I loved his mom, Mrs. Waters. She was a delight. Um, one day uh, I heard bad news that she had been taken to the hospital by ambulance. She had a heart attack. She nearly died. Um, about three weeks later, she had come home. And uh, I don't know, sometime after that, Mike and I were walking home from school and he seemed very dejected. And I asked, you know, what's what's wrong? What's going on? He said, it's my mom. What's wrong with your mom? I thought she was better. Yes, she's better. She didn't die, but she's just different. And I miss my old mom. I want my old mom back. And I said, oh, well, how is she different? And his words, well, she's become a Jesus freak. All she, all she talks about, heaven, the angels, God, and Jesus. And she she's just different. Well, I thought, well, okay. I don't know what to make of this, but we stop at his house with the proverbial milk and cookies, and there she is, glowing like a spotlight. I mean, she was t truly different. You could see the uh, the, uh, the light coming from her eyes. Her face was aglow. She was lit up like a Christmas tree, really amazing change. And, um, of course, I'm just fascinated by the, the physical difference. And, of course, when she sees me, she's happy to see me. It's the first time we seen each other since she had the heart attack and she's just on and on about God and love and the angels and heaven and Jesus and how she had left her body and she went up to heaven to enjoy this wonderful experience and she just wants me to know that God loves me and Jesus loves me and all is well and nothing to, to fear and so of course I went out and back with Mike to to play and uh I said, Yeah, I know what you mean. I get it. I see what you're I see what you're talking about. Well, that was my first interview with a, a near death experiencer at age eight in 1960. I didn't know what to make of it. The term hadn't been invented, but it stuck with me forever. Not at the forefront of my consciousness, but kind of, you know, buried in the recesses of my psyche. Well, um now I have to fast forward to the year nineteen sixty eight. And I, I'm uh, going into my junior year. And my best friend at the time was Jimmy Madonna. He had an older brother, four years older, Dominic Madonna, who had graduated Fort Lauderdale High School in 1967. And uh, Dominic was drafted. I loved Dominic. He was like a big brother to me. Taught me how to drive a car, how to fish, so on. And he was just a great guy. Had Frank, Frankie Avalon type looks. He was terrific. Anyway, he went off to join the Army uh, for the draft call, got put into uh, infantry, sent to Vietnam. And in August of 1969, we received the sad news that he was killed in Da Nang um, in a mortar attack. Oh, no. I wrote a tribute to him in the school paper, the high school paper. I was editor um, in 69-70. And I never forgot um, the pain that I felt when I received the news. First time I'd ever experienced death. So when I graduated high school, June of 1970, I went right to the recruiter, uh, the Army recruiter, downtown Fort Lauderdale. And this is all getting to why I, how I met Raymond. And it really kind of evidences what I call cosmic choreography. This is... Oh, understood. Yeah. yeah this is my life's purpose unfolding before my very eyes. Um, this is, um, I, I suppose, the path that either I chose for myself or that God chose for me. But these, we need to pay attention to these synchronicities when they happen because they're little nudge, nudge, wink, winks from spirit. And they're, they're evidential that spirit is around us and paying attention and guiding us, helping us whether it's to find a parking space or avoid an auto accident or to stay on course with one's life life's purpose. So the recruiter said, okay, um, um, you're here to enlist. You have a high school diploma and you're 18. Good for you, doing your patriotic duty. 
uh, how can we help you today? I said, I want the army and I want infantry and I want to go, I want to be assigned to this company. I want to do my basic at Fort Jackson and my infantry training at Fort Benning. And I want to go to Da Nang because I want to uh, avenge my friend's death and I want to uh, help uh, help the poor oppressed people of South Vietnam. At age 18, that's all I knew. I didn't know any more than that. Um, I found out a lot more later, but at the time, those were the only two motivations for me. Serve my country, avenge Dominic, and help the poor oppressed people of South Vietnam. Um, so I, I was um, told that he would do everything he could to meet my request, but first I had to take some aptitude tests. I did, and he said, sorry, we can't give you infantry. And I said, why not? And he said, you're scoring too high. You've got to go into this special uh, military occupational specialty called um, this high-speed encrypted digital communication. You need to get a top-secret clearance from the FBI and uh, you, you'll work computers. And I didn't know what a computer was. We're talking 1970. Nobody ever heard the word computer. So I certainly had. And so he said, they'll teach you what you need to know. I said, no deal. I'm going to Vietnam and infantry. I'm not doing this. He said, well, you already signed the contract and, you know, we're doing our best. You'll get to Vietnam because your specialty is needed over there. So don't worry, you'll get there. Um, okay, great. So I, I ended up going to Fort Gordon, Georgia in Augusta, Georgia for my advanced training because of this aptitude test score. And as it turned out, uh, that's where Raymond Moody was in Augusta, Georgia, enrolled at the Medical College of Georgia. So um, I think it's, I, it's I, kismet. I, yeah, I, I graduated honor graduate by a fluke. But that was an important fluke. I think he said it was a half a percentage point higher than the next student. He said it's tradition for the undergraduate to stay and teach. And I said, said well, I, I'm not a teacher. I don't know. He said, well, we'll teach you to teach. We'll, go, you'll go, we'll send you to instructor training. And that, too, was part of the plan. So he said, you can't refuse tradition. He no. said, you know, you're going to Germany, um, this rotation, and then the second rotation will be Vietnam. So you'll get your wish to go to Vietnam after the <laughs> first year of teaching. I said, okay, great. Okay. So I don't know, six months or so of teaching, I received the honor of being instructor of the month. And the commanding general comes over, presents the award. And after the ceremony, the executive officer comes over and says, hey, I'm, the general is impressed with you. He'd like you to come work in the command section. I said, well, sir, I'm only going to be here for another six months. I'm going to Vietnam. Well, don't you worry about that. We're going to take care of all that. <laughs> you don't say no to the general. Uh, okay, sir. All right, I'll do it. So I don't know anything about protocol, but yeah, okay, if that's what the general wants. So this general turned out to be very pivotal because he, he and I took a liking to each other. He was anti-war because like he every Sunday he would go to the uh, – Dwight Eisenhower Medical Center at Fort Gordon to visit the wounded who were there convalescing. And he yeah. wanted to be behind to hear their stories, which is where I got the real truth from the uh, the boots on the ground. And um, he said, you know, I think you have general officer material. I want you to go to college and become a general officer. I'm going to groom you for that, you know, objective. And I said, sir, I appreciate your confidence in me, but I am not college material. I don't have the smarts for college. I barely got through high school. And he said, oh, let me be the judge of that. Go to the guidance center, take the CLEP test, college level equivalency program, and we'll see what what we see. And I said, oh, sorry, I really, he said, he said, Sergeant, that's an order. I'm not, this is not a discussion, not a negotiation. It's an order. Yes, sir. Okay. So I, I went, I took the CLEP test, well, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. He said, hey, you, you finished your freshman year and you've got all these credits that we can apply toward your sophomore core, core curriculum requirements. So you, you finished almost a year and a half of college just by taking a test. So they admitted me at Augusta College. My first quarter full-time student after discharge was 
1974, I was elected president of the sociology club. Uh, we had our first meeting. <clears throat> a woman by the name of Kathy Tabakian was a member. And I asked one question. Uh, we were supposed to bring interesting speakers to campus. And we were, I asked if anyone knew of anyone who might want to speak. Kathy was the only one who raised her hand. Kathy is acknowledged in life after life. Um, and she said, my neighbor would be perfect, Dr. Raymond Moody. Uh, he's a student at the Medical College of Georgia. Now, this is nearby Augusta College. And I said, um, well, he's a doctor already? Oh, not an MD. He's getting his MD. But he's a PhD, philosophy, from Vir University of Virginia. I said, well, what do you lecture about? Plato? Uh, that would be boring. Nobody's going to want to hear that. She said, no, 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 he's doing, I'm helping him with this very interesting research concerning people who've died and left their bodies and gone to heaven to see God and Jesus. And they come back with these remarkable stories. And of course, then the memory from third grade bubbled up to the surface. Oh my God. I mean, that's when I heard the ring of destiny. And now if I had not heard Mrs. Waters tell her story, I would have, as an agnostic, I probably would have dismissed all of that because I was not uh, spiritual at that time in my life. I, I I gave up the Catholic faith for Lent, and uh, when I left home at age... Yes, I understand the feeling, yes. So, and I haven't been back since to organize religion. Uh, so I was not sure about the whole thing, the whole God question. So I was sort of an avowed agnostic, and I was only, I wanted truth. And I needed evidence and data to be convinced of truth. Um, and I would change my beliefs if new data emerged um, that, that warranted a change. So I said, Kathy, when can I meet this man? She goes, well, let me let, talk to him and see if he's open to that. And I'll let you know. So I think it was the next afternoon. I was over to meet Dr. Moody late in the afternoon. And, you know, we just hit it off instantly. We were best friends from the, from the start. And Raymond never, you know, he, he's a very friendly, affable gentleman. And, you know, he's a great. He's so delightful. I mean, frankly, he's such a sweetheart. He's a little Buddha, you know, and uh, <laughs> that's very, very good. Yes, he is. He's the greatest storyteller you'll ever want to meet. Yeah. The greatest humorist. He's got He's got a very interesting sense of humor, and you know, I'm a perfect straight man for him. So he, he, he would be, he he would be love, exactly right. He used to love being around me for that reason. So anyway, <laughs> I was helping him and meeting people who had these experiences, and I organized a talk. The first he, I think, he gave on the subject. He had just coined the term near death experience. He didn't write the book for about a year and a half later. It came out in the fall of 1975. Mm -hmm. Great classic that started it all uh, uh, in motion. So, you know, I, I, he, he was having phone chats with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and I started to research who she was, and um, she agreed to write the foreword. And um, she was speaking... Uh, I think it was Kennesaw Community College outside of Atlanta, not too far away. And I offered to drive Raymond so he could meet her in person. And the, the three of us met for the first time at that uh, venue. And um, it was a love fest. And I, I, I you sure. know, we we were they were comparing notes and agreeing with each other about the findings because she too was researching near-death experiences. And I felt like so privileged to be a fly on the wall there. And um, I must say that back when I gave Raymond uh, the opportunity to speak at Augusta College, he was happy to do it. But he said, you know, my research is still preliminary. And I said, well, just share what you think you know so far and just qualify it. Well, the Performing Arts Center was packed. And I organized a panel discussion of members of the clergy, other physicians, um, psychologists, sociologists, and so on, to get a cross-section of opinion. And the Performing Arts Center, I think it seated about three or 4,000 people. It was packed. There was standing room only. And when Raymond spoke, 
for the first time, to my knowledge, on near-death experiences, I got goosebumps all over. I mean, I got a, well, all I can describe, it was really like a download from spirit. Because I recognized the importance of these experiences, um, not just to transform the people who underwent the experiences, but who, uh, as they shared their stories, Raymond shared some of the uh, things they had said, some of the insights they had shared. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this can not only change human nature, this can change the nature of social, political and economic systems. This can bring heaven to earth. So I got the whole picture from from whole to part in this download from spirit, which is what led to the idea to form the associations. So I was I was like a an enthusiastic an enthusiastic cheerleader for this idea, and I kept hounding Raymond to let me proceed with using his name, because at this time um, other people were starting to write him experiencers and. Um, researchers, the people who wanted to do research. And he was like, I don't believe in organizations, John, you know, I'm not much into that sort of thing. Yep. And um, great idea. You can do it if you want, but I'm, I don't want to be part of that. And I went, Raymond, I can't do it without you. Nobody knows me. They know you. You're the MD, PhD. I'm, you know, I'm a lowly master's degree. You know, I mean, nobody's going to pay attention to me. He said, well, I'm just not. But when we had this meeting with Elizabeth, I, at the right time, I got a little nudge from Spirit. And I said, hey, Elizabeth, what do you think about the idea of, and Raymond was there, of course, uh, of an association to bring together people who've had these experiences so they can form a support system for one another, as well as researchers who want to study them. She said, that's a great idea. I, I think you should do it. I said, well, would you be part of it? She said, tell you what. You organize it, you get it off the ground, and I'll, I'll become a member of your board. And I thought that was delightful. So on the drive back from Atlanta, Raymond suddenly got on board, and um, he agreed to let me form the association. Um, and we held our first organizational meeting in Charlottesville. At that point, Raymond had moved to Charlottesville to do his residency in psychiatry, and um, we held our first meeting there in his home. And then I think we rented a room at a Holiday Inn, a big conference room. And Bruce Grayson was there and Ken Ring and Mike Sabom and uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Beverly Belk and a few others um, loved the idea of the association. And that's where it was born. Uh, they all became co-founders. And that's what eventually became the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I organized it. I ran it for the first four or five years. I think it's first president. And um, uh, and then I, I threw the ball over to Ken, and um, we moved it to the University of Connecticut stores, and he ran it from there, and, and that's how it all started. But I want to pay, I want everybody to pay attention to all the things that had to happen in order for me to meet Raymond. Uh, that cannot be coincidental. Um, no, obviously. Uh, the mathematics of it are are, are too impressive. Um, so to me, I call it cosmic choreography. Those were dance steps uh, choreographed by God. And I just was kind of like going with the flow. So to me, it's extremely important work. Um, extremely important subject, especially at this time, critical time in human affairs. So that's a long-winded answer to your question about how I met Raymond. <laughs> no, but I thought it was fascinating. And he is a delightful person. He's uh, totally um, friendly. I hadn't seen him in person, I don't know, in probably six or seven years. And um, when I first had him on to talk about um, this most recent book, I, you know, I said, hi. And he said, hi. Oh, how are you? The last time I saw him, I had dinner with him at some conference. But he remembered me and he was so friendly. That's Raymond. He just, <laughs> that's who he is. A ball of love. 
yeah, that's exactly who he is. It was like, where have I been all this time? He, all he wanted to do was talk about, you know, old times and, you know, how I've been and all that. He was, he's such a lovely, lovely man. He really is. And a, a prodigious intellect, always reading, always writing, always coming up with new ideas. And, um, you know, he just has a indefatigable spirit. Um, he keeps trying new things. Yes. I mean, I mean, he's he coined, coined, coined near death experiences, shared death experiences. That's something new, no one had ever heard of before. Right. And and um, he he uh, did his psychomantium. I mean, he does he does stuff. Yes. A lot of people don't want to try these new things. I mean, he could have just rested on his near death experiences laurels for the rest of his life, and nobody would have thought anything of it, but he keeps trying new ideas. Exactly. You know, he's um, a credit to the human race. I wish there were more like him. Yeah, lovely man. But so, so all right, so you, you've been doing this, you've been doing your professional work, and then you got, um, you, you got involved with uh, Evan Alexander and his project. Tell us about that project now, too. Oh, yeah. That's Eternia, uh, and I call it IANS 2.0. Um, as I say, I ran IANS for the first four or five years, and then Ken took it over from there. And it became clear to me early on that IANS wanted to be oriented around the near-death experience, and it, it really wanted to be a support system for people who had these experiences. Um, and a data pool for researchers who wanted to study them. And that seemed to be, uh, the, for the most part, the focus that everyone was comfortable with. Yes, that's how it's turned out. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah, and so that to me was, and th those those activities are very important. I don't uh, miss, wish to denigrate them in any way. Um, they're vitally important. Uh, but my interest has always been at the macro level. How can we uh, ha harvest and harness the knowledge from these experiences to impact human nature in general and to change the nature of social, political, and economic systems? How can we use this information, apply it in practical ways to make the world a much better place before we self-destruct? Because... We continue as a human as human species, we continue to make very poor choices coming from a very limited myopic frame of reference. And Elizabeth was very concerned about this. Yes. Um, Raymond was too, to a degree, but not to the extent that it's Elizabeth... It's hard to get him down enough for him to be concerned about those things. He's, so it was all he's about, a bundle of joy, kind of. Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth was, can, we need to learn to love one another or we're going to self-destruct. That's right. And she yeah, was, yeah. you know, she didn't pull punches. She didn't mince, mince words. She didn't equivocate. For her, it was sure. all this evidential of life after death. Raymond equivocated for quite some time until he finally, you know, went into the deep water. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the evidence was overwhelming for him at some point. Uh, yeah. But Elizabeth was there from the from the very beginning. She was right there with me um, philosophically. We were aligned, right. and and she had the same sense of urgency. Um, we need to uh, do uh, expeditious work in this area for all the good it can do. So I kind of took my leave from IANS at that point. I think 1985 or so because. I realized that it was going to focus on the micro level uh, priorities, which were important, um, but it wasn't what interested me. So I, it was around that time that I uh, started collaborating with Edgar Mitchell. And Edgar, you know, being a scientist from a PhD from uh, MIT and an astronaut and a career naval aviator, he was man of science and he was interested in physics and cosmology, and he wanted to take a uh, the, the approach of a physicist to, to consciousness. He had, on his way back from the moon, he had a spiritually transformative experience, as I recall. Yes. 
Yes, he did. Called the oneness epiphany. Yes. He he went to the moon. He said a, a technician. And he came back. He said a humanist and a futurist. Um, and he's, because of this oneness epiphany where he just realized that everything was part of the same grand matrix. It was somehow interconnected, interrelated, interdependent. He looked at the blue marble from, from, yeah. from the spaceship going, coming back. Yeah. I remember reading about it at the, at yeah. the time. It was quite yeah. overwhelming. Well, he came back and he formed the International, uh, what was called Noetics, the, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Yes, that's Noetic, right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was because he wanted to know more about what happened to him. Um, right. uh, the people he consulted, some of them said he had a samadhi um, or an epiphany or, or, or the oneness epiphany. And it led him to consciousness. Well, he wanted to explore consciousness from the standpoint of a physicist. Yes. And, you know, how can we uh, answer whether consciousness survives death if we can't define consciousness? You know, to this day, science doesn't have a, 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 an accepted... They, they, they don't get it at all. You're right. Right. So, because they're looking at it from the, the materialistic paradigm... But anyway, so Ed got interested in quantum hologram, and he said, you know, John, this is another way to get where you want to go, but through the mantle of hard science, as opposed to the, he he called it pseudoscience um, of near-death experiences, because that's all anecdotal stuff. Well, that wasn't very nice of him. Well, you know, he, again, he, PhD from MIT, and he's a slide rule kind of guy, you know, a numbers kind of guy, and he wanted evidence too, hard evidence, laboratory stuff you could test in the laboratory, you know, measure in a test tube. That's the, that was his um, training, um, and I respected him for it. And I said, you know, the only way we're going to get to paradigm shift is to uh, have hard evidence, such as what he was describing. Mm-hmm. So I learned about the quantum hologram and about the uh, the quantum world, the world of quanta and how it interfaces with consciousness uh, through thought and intention, torsion Mm -hmm. physics, the spin fields that impact particle behavior. And I got very excited about it because I thought, you know, this is great because this certainly will get everybody to stand up and take notice. Um, And um, nobody was interested in learning about the quantum hologram (laughs) Quantum emission and absorption or quantum entanglement. So that didn't really go over very well. And uh, in 2011, um, IANS invited me to come speak. Uh, they asked me to come speak every 10 years or so as one of the founders um, to celebrate the anniversary. And um, Evan Alexander was in the audience. And Raymond and Bruce and I were up on stage and giving our our, each our, our recollections and Evan came up to me afterward and introduced himself and said, Hey, you know, I'm trying to write a book. I'm a neurosurgeon. I've had an NDE and I uh, would like to get help with my book and getting it published. I said, well, sure. You know, will you come to my speech tomorrow? I'm going to talk about my experience. <laughs> so I said, sure. You know, I'm happy to do it. And um, He said, I was a materialist at Harvard. You know, I've taught that when the body dies, so does consciousness. But I don't believe that anymore. So he said, tell me about you. You know, how did you make this transition from being an agnostic to being a man of conviction? Uh, Did you have an experience? I said, none of the kind you're describing, no. Uh, I have many others, which, of course, I write about in my book, including life-saving angel encounters. But I said, I've never been out of my body that I know of. And I've never traveled to the other side that I know of, like you have. And he said, well, you know, I want to know all about IANS, how it started, and why you kind of took leave from it, what you're doing with Edgar Mitchell. So I went through all of it with him, and he said, we got to work together. He said, you know, I I came back for this purpose. So we formed um, Eternia at that point, which IANS 2.0, it's only, uh, it was to embrace the things that were important to me, in the, at the macro level versus what uh, IANS was focused on. I, I thought about trying to approach um, 
IANs to to work together, but I didn't think that they were the I don't think the culture was ready to go where I wanted to go at that point. Uh, and maybe not even today. I don't know, but I'm not really that connected with it. Um, but I um, I I brought Evan to meet Ed. Uh, there was a meeting of, of the minds, and we said we're not getting anywhere with Quantrek and the quantum hologram because nobody wants to talk about it. You know, you know, whenever you mention quantum physics and everybody glazes over and they have to excuse themselves for a bathroom break, you know, so, you know, but near death experiences, especially from a Harvard neuro, neurosurgeon, maybe we can finally get funded. So we agreed to join forces and Eternia became the metaphysical side. And, um, you know, contract became the physics side of it. So uh, different avenues of inquiry and in, um, different research designs, but nevertheless, equally yeah. valid and equally headed in the same direction. Uh, and I thought it was very exciting because you're approaching it, you know, from two different directions, but they were flip sides of the same coin. So... Edgar died um, in 2016. Um, we never attracted the kind of funding we were hoping to receive for Quantrek. And at that point, we just kind of let it go and we just became Eternia and stayed focused on spiritually transformative experiences in general. Uh, all phenomena that point to the question of what is consciousness and its dis disposition at the point of physical death. So that's what happened there. That's how that evolved. Well, you've certainly been at the center of all of this, which to me is is a fascinating place to be. I mean, you've seen so much. You've you've uh, been been and, and I think your personality is very good for this because you've been around some big egos, big minds, big ideas. And you've just been very supportive of all these people. You were sort of the glue in many of these cases, I think. Well, thank you. And, you know, I'm humbled by, by your compliments. And um, this data, these, these data, this evidence has impacted me profoundly. And that's really what my book is about, how I went from being an agnostic to being a man of deep conviction not based on faith and dogma, but based on data, evidence. And I am constantly reminded from an evidential point of view that the, the spiritual realm is real, that, oh, we're, yes. that we're surrounded by eternity and infinity, that um, the angels are real, God is real. And I mean, I get reminders of it all the time, and they're, they're minor miracles, sometimes they're major miracles. And yeah. I just want to shake people and say, would you please wake up and smell the roses? Because yeah. we don't have to be living in a cesspool. I mean, we can go out and swim in the ocean. We can we can dance on the clouds. We don't have to be stuck in the tar pits clubbing each other with femur bones, for crying out loud. So, you know, I'm like, I, you know, people, see, even with attorney, as simple as I try to make it, well, we don't quite get it. These seven statements and these 15 elaborations, which people can read at Eternia.org, how is this going to change the world? Oh, okay. John. Yeah, let me, I, let me I get emails that. every day from people yeah. who don't get it. And right. I just want to shake them by their shoulders or their throat and say, my God, well, don't you get it? Don't you understand you know, you're absolutely right to feel that way, and I share those feelings at the same time. I mean, let's put it this way. I wouldn't quite be so uh, on edge about it if we weren't in such a terrible yes. state of affairs on the planet. But we're getting going. It's getting worse by the day. And I don't know how much time we have. And, you know, time is an illusion, I grant you. But I've just started to start to teach a course and get as many people as possible to just sit for a minute and get this basic stuff. So let me tell you the story before we run out of time, because I know. Yes, yeah, go about. ahead. Go ahead. Because this is another way, another piece of the puzzle, another piece of evidence about how God communicates. Um, <laughs> and it's just when you think, you know, you're getting frustrated and you're not making 
the impact you want to make and nobody understands the big picture and nobody gets wants to fund what you're doing because they don't understand it, even as simple as you try to make it. So David Lorimer, who heads up the um, Scientific and Medical Network of Europe, was celebrating his 50th uh, anniversary this year. And he gave me the honor of being part of the uh, celebration, uh, a different speaker every week for a certain period of time in honor of being uh, 50 years old. So I accepted. It was a great pr privilege. And he came back and he chose the date of February 14 for my talk. And I said, David, why did you choose that date? He said, I don't know, just random, at random. I said, the spirit guide you to choose that date? He said, not that I know of. I think we just it just seemed to work. Well, you know, David, that's a very um, synchronistic choice because that's the first anniversary of my book. I published it a year ago, February 14. I published it as a love letter to God. And that's all I said. I said, do you mind if I do something on the theme of love? Since it's Valentine's Day, he said, no, go ahead, but send me a draft of what you propose to say. Because, you know, we're talking hardcore scientists and medical doctors and throughout Europe. And I said, OK, great. So I said, let me tie it to Valentine's Day. I did not know where Valentine's Day came from. I just decided to research the history. <laughs> and I found a man named Valentinus who lived in ancient Rome. He was martyred in the year 269, beheaded by Claudius II because he was a Christian. And he was a healer as well. That's how he got on the radar screen. You know, how do you do these healings? I'm just a vessel for God's love. God's love, Jesus, the love of Jesus comes through me and heals the person I'm working on. Um, and... I can't say more than that. I don't understand it. It's just the grace of God. You sure you're not, you're not a sorcerer? You're not doing black magic or, you know, booga booga. And, uh, you know, Valentinus, I'm a Christian. It all comes from love of God, love of Christ. Well, you know, we're not too fond of Christians. This is the Roman Empire, third century. And, you know, we put Christians to death in a very brutal, brutal way. So, because you have this gift, I'm going to give you a choice. You can either go to your death in a brutal way, or you can renounce Christianity. He said, I, I have to be true to what is true. I know this is true because it's working, and I feel it. It would be like telling me to deny my own existence or to deny, deny the sun. Can't do it. Okay, off to the dungeon with you. So he's put in the, the dungeon and sentenced to die. And the jailer, who had heard about his healing ability, had a blind daughter named Julia. And he said, Valentinus, would you do me a favor and try to heal my daughter? Julia, she's been blind since birth. And he said, I'll try. The healing part is up to God. I'm just a vessel. So he worked on her, and sure enough, her blindness was cured. And the jailer became a Christian, along with his entire household, seeing is believing. So he couldn't spare Valentinus because he was on the radar screen of the emperor, but he did release as many Christian prisoners as he could without invoking wrath. And the night before, or the wee hours before his death, I guess he stayed awake, he was executed on February 14. He's, he's now St. Valentine or St. Valentinus in the Catholic Church. Um, he wrote a letter to Julia, a love letter, but it wasn't Eros, it was agape love. It was, Julia, thank you for letting me be a vessel for God's love, and love is all there is, and, you know, um, I, I, I'm grateful to you for having this one more opportunity to, to, to feel God's love coursing through me. And he signed it, Your Valentine, so historians generally regard that letter as the first Valentine's Day love letter. And that's yes. how the tradition originated. Now, tell me something. <laughs> is that magical or what? Um, beautiful. So that's uh, my life is full of stories like this. And I'm just giving you a couple. My book's got several more um, that are worth reading. And if my stories don't convince people of 
uh, of the existence of God, then I, I give all kinds of ways they can have their own epiphanies and so that God becomes real to them. But the bottom line is, if we don't start doing what Kuba Ross recommended all those years ago, we don't start loving one another, then um, I feel that we're going to have um, a dark night of the soul collectively, and it's, it's not going to be pleasant. And it's all going to be self-inflicted. So uh, we don't have to go down that road. We have free will. We can change it. Uh, apocalyptic visions, uh, Armageddon, this doesn't have to happen. Um, now, the probabilities may be, given human nature, that it's going to happen. But if they read the book and heed the book, go to the Eternia website and heed the messages there, then we can have a much better time of it down here. Fortunately, Jesus is working through you and quite a few people now yep. to try to, to change things. Yep. As I said, I'm also teaching a course in following the teachings of Jesus. And it's we're we're in our beta, our beta course, and uh the I think it's already helping people. So I'm gonna to continue to do it. Absolutely. So each of us has our own way to to kind of try to make this work. Each one, teach one. Well, I'm so sorry, but we really have run out of time. We'll have to do this again, my dear. Yes, I would love to. Thank you, Roberta. It's great to see you again and um, keep on doing the good work. And you as well. I think what you're doing is great. I mean, I, I belong to attorney, or at least I did. I don't know that they're still collecting dues, but I used to pay dues to it. No, we don't We don't collect dues anymore. People can make contributions if they choose to through PayPal at attorney.org, um, and it's tax deductible. We're a 501c3. Um, but um, we don't solicit. We don't do active fundraising. Uh, attorney is a big ship. It's got seven program components. It's going to require a huge budget to operationalize. So, I mean, I, since I don't seem to have prospects for that, I just kind of like you know, let go and let God on the question of funding. Yeah, that, that's how that's I think that's best, too. That's what we're doing with teachings by Jesus dot com. We're sort of seeing where it wants to go. And I think you need to do that, too. Yeah, that's a good thing. But I, I I'm a supporter. I think what you're doing is great. Well, bless but, your heart. Thank you. <laughs> But anyway, I'm so sorry. We have totally run out of time. And, and all my dear, dear friends, this has been really, I think, quite special. This has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. I'm so happy you could be with us today. Please never forget that you are a powerful, eternal being. You never began. You never will end. And when you get that, it changes everything in your life for the better. Next week, our guest will be Brandy Gilmore. Brady's a researcher and a mind-body healing expert. She had an accident in 2003 and left her disabled and in pain, and the doctors couldn't help her, so she figured she'd better help herself. And what she discovered was a, some cell... I don't really even get this because I haven't gotten far enough into her book, but self-healing mechanisms using our minds that are not the normal meditation and she claims in the book and as i said i haven't read far enough the book is called master your mind and energy to heal your body she discovered ways to heal herself and now she's this gorgeous woman who's all healed and she shares the research there in that book that changed her life and she's now using it to help others she's also done a tedx talk this sounds fascinating don't you think especially for people who have chronic pain and um, join us next week. Let's see what, let's see what she has to tell us. And this week, our guest has been John R. Audette, who was here for the fourth time. And I think his stories are fascinating because he has been in the spiritually transformative experiences field since its beginning. And as you can see, he's a wonderfully thoughtful man who has made wonderful friends and done wonderful things. To, and he's very working very hard now to kind of bring humankind back from the brink, which to me is what we all should be doing in our own, own special ways. His book is called Love by the Light, True Stories of Divine Intervention and Providence. And I think it's a wonderful book. I urge everyone to read it. So 
I hope you've enjoyed today. I certainly have. And now, of course, it's time once again to just mention that Seek Reality Online is your one-stop resource for all things afterlife. Just go to seekreality.com and start to learn for yourself that your own reality really is eternal. Our dear friend Craig Hogan who works very hard to help people understand there and the, the resources he has there are almost unbelievable. To help, He works hard to help people understand that your life really is eternal. And teachingsbyjesus.com is your single resource for all the divine truths that Jesus taught. You can't get them from Christianity, frankly, which is not his religion. He didn't have anything to do with starting it. That was the Roman Emperor Constantine, and it happened 300 years after Jesus was was risen. But now, when as the religion kind of fades, Jesus has finally decided it's time for his truths. So if you start with something like teachingsbyjesus.com, or even just get yourself a red-letter Bible and start reading the Gospels, you can finally meet Jesus where he lives. And that's about all we have time for. So this has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Please enjoy and make the most of this coming week in our one reality, always knowing, always certain that you are a powerful, eternal being and knowing, never forgetting for a moment that you, most of all in this entire universe, you are perfectly, infinitely, and forever eternally loved. You've been listening to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Roberta blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Join us every week as we explore what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about the one reality we all share. Knowing the truth changes everything.